how often do insects work together? That might sound like a strange question. On one end, you have insects like mosquitoes that operate entirely on their own. Even though it might feel like they're teaming up on you during a summer evening, rest assured, each mosquito is hunting alone. But then you have honeybees and paper wasps, which clearly live in hives or nests with organized structures for gathering food, raising young, and defending their colonies. So just what kind of teamwork is there amongst different insects? Do we see different levels of cooperation across different species? Well, in this video, we're going to explore the remarkable spectrum of cooperation amongst insects. Some even cooperate to the point where they work together so seamlessly they could rival even the most sophisticated of human teams. Social behavior amongst insects is perhaps more common than you may think. But not all insects operate like honeybees or ants who aggregate together in big colonies with a very defined set of roles where everyone works to support the queen and the colony. So let's take a look at the spectrum of social behavior in insects. At the very bottom level are insects that, well, aren't social at all. Solitary insects. Solitary insects perform just about every life task alone. They feed alone. They find a mate alone. If they mate, the female will lay eggs alone. They leave those eggs to hatch alone and the cycle continues. Many, perhaps most Lepidoptera will work this way, as do Diptera, the true flies, like house flies or fruit flies or blowflies. If we move up one level from there, we have what's called subsocial behavior. Subsocial insects typically form a family unit with one or both parents providing at least some sort of care for their offspring, even if only for a brief period of time. And we use the term care very loosely here. This behavior can range from simple egg guarding to more elaborate behaviors of actually providing food resources or a particular nest habitat for when the larvae hatch. The tiny lacebug, Gargaphia solani, illustrates how even modest parental defense can greatly improve offspring survival. Females remain with their nymphs, charging at and deterring far larger predators like lady beetles. Or you have the example of the male giant water bug that we've used multiple times throughout our video series. They carry eggs on their backs, ensuring adequate oxygen flow, and they shield the eggs from harm. So subsocial behavior is mostly about caring for offspring in some way, shape, or form. Next are communal insects, where members of the same generation may share a nest or an oviposition site but don't cooperate in brood care necessarily. Here, females might deposit eggs together, and upon hatching, larvae or juvenile nymphs might stay in groups to feed or to protect themselves. Book lice, for example, form aggregations on bark or leaves where the nymphs collectively graze on lichens. Aphids can also live communally, benefiting from alarm pheromones that alert others to danger. You could have tent caterpillars, sawfly larvae, leaf beetle larvae. They all feed in a synchronized cluster. They may even flick their bodies in unison to deter predators or spin communal silk shelters. Although these behaviors don't involve brood care, they still offer benefits in defense, resource exploitation, and overall survival. The next rung up the ladder from there, you have quasi-social behavior and semi-social behavior. Quasi-social and semi-social species sit between communal behavior and full-blown eusocial behavior. In quasi-social groups, members of the same generation not only live together, but also cooperate in caring for each other's offspring. 
For instance, multiple female allodapine bees might share a single nest and help rear one another's broods, effectively reducing the chance of a total nest failure. Even certain burying beetles can adapt quasi-social behavior. Multiple unrelated females will cooperatively prepare a large carcass and feed the larva together, taking advantage of abundant resources. In semi-social species, there's also a cooperative brood care that emerges amongst females of the same generation, but now you have a reproductive caste that becomes delineated from a helper caste. A caste is simply a subset of individuals within the group who carry out a specific specialized function, like reproduction or assisting with foraging and brood care. A typical case can be seen with some Polistes paper wasps during early nest founding, when a group of females jointly builds and provisions the nest. One or a few individuals become the primary egg layers, while the rest help to raise the brood. In some semi-social sweat bees, such as Lassioglossum malaturum, colony social structure allows for flexibility. Even if the founding queen dies, especially early in the season, many of the remaining females, who are typically of the same generation, can become reproductive and collectively continue caring for the brood. This cooperative social structure helps to ensure colony success, even in the absence of a single dominant queen. The pinnacle of social behavior in insects can be found in eusocial colonies, featuring cooperative brood care, specialized reproductive and non-reproductive castes, and overlapping generations. Colonies typically form a stable nest, where usually only one individual, the queen, lays eggs. Drones, when present, exist solely for mating. The vast majority of individuals non-reproductive workers specialize in tasks like nest maintenance, foraging, defense, and brood care. In many ant and termite species, colonies also include a distinct soldier caste. These are larger individuals with specialized morphology, such as enlarged mandibles or reinforced heads, adapted for defending the nest against intruders. The behavior of each group within the colony is tightly coordinated through chemical communication, most often via pheromones, and reinforced by tactile and behavioral signals. At maturity, eusocial colonies can reach staggering sizes, sometimes numbering in the millions. Yet, despite their scale, they function as a cohesive, integrated whole. Sometimes these types of insect societies are even thought of as superorganisms. In the superorganism analogy, the queen serves as the gonads, producing new offspring. Workers that forage and distribute food might resemble the digestive system. Defenders and soldiers act like the immune or muscular systems. Temperature regulating workers help maintain internal stability, much like a thermoregulatory system. And the pheromonal network that governs communication mirrors a kind of nervous system, allowing rapid coordination and control. Each caste fulfills a distinct role, contributing to the health and survival of the colony as a unified and interconnected biological entity. So who lives like this? Well, lots of hymenopteran species like ants, many wasps, and most bees. Beyond the hymenoptera, Isoptera termites have similarly advanced societies, but their colonies have both a king and a queen in the colony's reproductive center. They then have various castes of workers that perform specialized functions. Interestingly, in a very different group, the aphids, some species develop soldier morphs that will defend the colony against predators, showing that elements of advanced social structure can appear in insects even without large permanent nests. Now, this level of eusocial behavior seems to fly a little bit in the face of Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. Consider the basic premise of natural selection. Traits are favored if they enhance an individual's ability to survive and pass on genes. Yet, in a eusocial colony, an entire cast of individuals never reproduces at all. Instead, thousands of sterile workers labor for the success of one or just a handful of reproductive individuals. 
how could non-reproducing workers possibly be part of the story of evolution if they never have a chance to pass on their genes? Charles Darwin himself recognized this contradiction. But here's what he wrote in his book on the origin of species. This difficulty, though appearing insuperable, is lessened, or as I believe disappears, when it is remembered that selection may be applied to the family as well as to the individual, and thus gain the desired end. But at the time, in the mid to late 1800s, and even the early 1900s, the idea of group or colony level benefits was far less worked out than the burgeoning idea of individual-based selection. Some critics even felt that this phenomenon of sterile workers might threaten to dismantle Darwin's theory that hinged on traits being favored when they help individuals leave more offspring. So traits that halt reproduction would appear fatal to the logic of his theory. Well, in the next video, we'll take a look at how you social insect societies may have developed. We'll put this idea of kin selection to the test and see where things land. But until then, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.